Dan, one of the things that the data shows in this energy transition is that we are very close to fossil fuel peak demand. And so we're talking coal, oil, and gas, if we haven't peaked already. That's right. Um, and I mean, so by, by it depends on what measure you look at, what kind of metrics you look at, but you can very clearly see uh, fossil fuels peaking in one sector after the next, one country after the next. We are more or less, I mean, structural growth of fossil fuels has been gone for the better part of a decade now. And we're kind of bouncing around this sort of plateau that is, you know, a slightly increasing plateau. But overall, if you compare this to historical demand growth for fossil fuels, we are already at a in a plateau uh, at the moment. And I think what we're waiting for right now is just when that plateau turns into decline. And obviously, we have many indicators right now that we see daily in the news happening from the rise of EVs and the decline of LNG, uh, that that peak uh, uh, is happening and that we actually are coming off that plateau and going into decline now. I, I want to talk about some work that I've done in the in the, the distant past about this very topic. And and that is the, the trend of the arc. And so... Um, you know, 40 years ago, I was doing my graduate thesis on the transition from uh, horses and steam to power farming in Saskatchewan, 1900 to 1930. The point here is that it was the adoption of in the mechanization of agriculture, in particular the grain farming in Western Canada. And it is essentially, it's the, it's the growth of uh, adoption of tractors and the displacement of horses. And if you look at the curve from 1900 to 1950, it's just a classic S curve. And it's a classic decline of the horses being displaced. And here's the point I wanna, I wanna raise to, to, to discuss with you, is if you look at what happened in those years, you had uh, a, a world war between 1914 and 1918. Uh, uh, then you had the Spanish flu. Then you had a severe recession. Then you had the Great Depression starting in 29 or 30. And then you had the Second World War. But if you look at the, the curve the, uh, created by the data, it's smooth. You would never know. And so the, the lesson to take away from that, and I think this applies to what you're doing, is that don't get caught up in the day-to-day -day data. It's the arc of the trend that really matters here. And the arc of the trend supports your argument, not the argument for fossil fuels. Yeah, and it, it lies at the core of uh, the analysis that we do, right? If you want to look multiple decades into the future, surely you need to look at multiple decades into the past to get that trend, right? It makes very little sense to be distracted by the day-to-day -day news when you want to do decadal forecasting. It makes very little sense to talk about policy and uh, uh, specific you know, uh, technology fads that are happening today, you need to look at the fundamentals, the really fundamental drivers of this transition. And, and that's what we indeed try to do in our outlooks, is we try to every time take a 50, if not 100 year historical view to catch on to the larger trends that are happening. And we're trying to really dig into the fundamentals that, lie, that underpin energy, which for us are the, the physics, economics, and geopolitics of this transition. Uh, and the fundamental drivers that we have there. And, and I really like your horses example, actually, Mark, because I think in this example, and I think we can play with that a bit, is like, I think where we find ourselves right now in the transition is 1910 transport transition. We find ourselves in this moment where horses are still dominant in the system. We find ourselves in a moment where the growth of demand is a growth of transport demand is now largely driven by the car. Horse is still a little bit there, but still mostly with the car. And we're at this moment where, you know, if we would go back then, sort of the, the horse lobby would say, see, cars are only coming on top of the horses system. This is just a, going to be a system with lots of horses and lots of cars. And this is the future that we're going towards. And all the evidence that we see from the fossil lobby today arguing that for fossil fuels is very similar to the evidence that you could easily see in 1910 for horses and cars. And this is, I think, another indication that we're in this sort of peak moment. We're just before the rapid decline sets in. We know how the horses story went after 1910. Within 20 to 30 years, most horses left uh, here in the U.S. And, and globally, we see very rapidly this transition to cars happening. And I think the same is happening in the fossil fuel system right now. We're at this peak. Um, the arguments to argue that there's now going to be a more and more and more fossil fuels point, right? That's good. The renewables are just going to layer on top just very much sounds like the car is just going to come on top of the horse. 
Uh, let's continue that analogy then, because um, the what really changed for uh, agriculture uh, is the introduction of the Fordson tractor in 1918, which was basically Henry Ford uh, built a tractor that was based on his automobile technology. So it came out of assembly, it came out of factories off assembly lines. It used technology that for the day was well-developed, it was robust, and it was cheap. And this was a major advance uh, for, for tractors. So uh, from 1918 on, the, this is where you start to see the technology becoming competitive. And you, the reason we know this, Dan, is because the U.S. Department of Agriculture studied it to death at the time. They went out and in, in Idaho and Illinois and Ohio, places like that, they were actually on the ground calculating the cost of if I had to plow an, uh, an acre of land and I had a one horse team, a two horse team, a three horse team or a tractor, and then they could compare the cost per acre. And this is amazing stuff that, that we, uh, you know, we have uh, forgotten about. And what they found was the tractor started with the one horse team. Oh, and then it was, so the tractor is now 1920. It's more economic, lower cost per acre. Then it was the two horse team. And then by the late 1920s, it was cheaper than the three horse team. And that's exactly precisely the process we have now. The equivalent is you can look at it in automobiles, in solar panels, in wind turbines, you name it. It's the technology gets better and then it picks off the various competitors one by one over a period of time. And that is the trend of the arc here. And it's also why it's so silly to take any moment in time, like today, or reports from five years ago, the day that was back then, and look at the whole energy system and say, what's within reach with current technologies? And then either stress out about the fact that the last 25% of the fossil system we don't have proper alternatives for, or you know somehow draw conclusions out of it that we therefore we need other uh, uh, technologies like carbon capture and storage or DAC offsets to, 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 to counter that. Because that's not how technology revolutions develop, as you put it, right? It's a domino effect always. It starts small and it gets bigger and bigger. And, and you know, change begets change. Um, and I think this is one of the big misconceptions where we for instance see that the tech sector in the world really gets this. They get this sort of accelerating change and self-reinforcing change. And, and that's how investors look at new tech products. And, and you know, in Silicon Valley in the US, they that's their, that's their change model very much for the tech sector. But somehow... People tend to forget that when they then go to the energy sector and they think that this works completely differently, not recognizing that what we're seeing in energy happening right now is also just a tech revolution, right? The solar panels and batteries and this kind of stuff, they're also actually very similar to digital tech uh, technologies that are rolling out. Um, and so we tend to kind of forget this um, snowball effect. I would argue that the reason for that is the fundamental difference between the types of energy we're talking about. The energy of the previous 125 years is a commodity combusted to create heat, which is then used to generate uh, work. It, it could be the internal combustion engine. It could be uh, gas turbines. It could be boilers or whatever it is. But you first you have to burn it. Then you convert it into heat, which then does your work for you, which might be heating up water or driving a crankshaft or whatever it is. And the uh, modern technology is to generate electricity and then take it and apply it directly to your device that will do the work for you. So you generate electricity with a solar panel, panel and then you put it in the battery of your electric vehicle and away you go. And so it's far, far more efficient that way. And that argues for displacement, not addition. I agree. And and it's it's the it's the weakest part of the fossil system is just its thermodynamic inefficiency, right? Two thirds of the energy that we put into our energy system goes up in, goes up in smoke, literally goes up in smoke because we burn it in, in boilers and in and, and, uh, engines. Um, electricity is just such a simpler and leaner way to set up your energy system. It's also one of the things where you start realizing when you take a step back, like it's, it's, it's leaner uh, uh, electricity because it's more efficient, but it's also just so much more fungible. You can do anything with electricity, right? Any energy service you can think of, you can do with electricity. 
you can't do that with a lump of coal. Like if you think of a lump of coal, you, it's very limited what you can do with it. You can heat things up and then you can make very complicated machinery to actually turn that heat into something. But the electricity is already sort of at its sort of most advanced stage, right? It's the, one of the highest exergy energy sources that we know. It can immediately be deployed directly in machinery, but also in data centers. You can do information energy services with it. You can make heat, you can do, drive a car. Uh, energy is also so uh, such a superior energy source because it's well, more efficient, first and foremost, but second, multi-deployable. And that is, I think, really uh, uh, the, the, the weakness of fossil fuels in, uh, versus electricity today um, in final energy demand, is that electricity is just multi-deployable and can cut out so much waste. And so I think another report from the ETC that came out last week, again, showed we can double, if not triple, our energy services demand. So the amount of cars we drive, the the liters of water we uh, we heat up for warm showers, etc. Uh, we can double or triple that even while lowering overall energy demand, and that's just because electricity is so much more efficient. Uh, let's conclude this interview with a discussion of where we're seeing peaks already. So, in industry, which is was always considered to be the hard to abate uh, sector, uh, we've already seen fossil fuel uh, energy demand peak in 2014 in buildings in 2018, in road transport 2019, and in the power sector. Um, I didn't see a number for the power sector. Are, are we already peaked in power, in power or not? It's hard to say. We're very optimistic at the moment that it's actually this year, that this year is the peak year in power. So you can see over the past like 15, 20 years, you can go back, you can look at the total growth of electricity demand and what share of that comes from fossil fuels. And that share is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, over the past couple of years, it was, uh, you know, somewhere around like 20, 30 percent coming from fossil fuels. Uh, we have strong indicators. So we know that for the first half of 2025, actually all the growth of electricity demand came from renewables. Uh, fossil fuels on the net declined. That's the indication of a peak. Of course, you can only call a peak a few years after. Uh, so uh, we will know soon, uh, by soon I mean within the next year or two, if this is a structural peak that we see continuing, which is what we expect, and we'll have proper evidence for that in, in two years, or whether we, it, we're we still bouncing along a, a, a plateau on electricity. But you're right, across the board, whether you look at buildings, industry, transport also kind of at the moment happening um, and, uh, and, and the power sector, we see peaks everywhere across sectors. Well, Dan, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. 